not an expert on gender or on children, just ask my kids. And my own personal gender identity is relatively uninteresting. I would say that I fall, and you can, you can sort of show of hands, I fall between sort of butchy femme and femme butch. <laughs> and um, so let me figure that one out. And I have to uh, assume that one of the reasons, or the reason that Barb had asked me to do this, um, uh, to speak today, was because I am very out as a lesbian. And more so, and specifically, I am very out as a lesbian mom. Growing up gay gives me insight that I hope I can offer to you about what it's like to perhaps be a queer kid from my perspective. However, my most revolutionary action has involved becoming a mother, getting married, and having kids. And that was my most subversive act. So today I'll talk to you a little bit about my journey to be out, about the subversion, in my opinion, of out motherhood, and about my own son's struggles with the beast of gender. Currently, I am writing on a new sitcom for Global TV, and I'm creating a new drama series for City TV and a night with theaters a playwright in residence. I am not doing any of those particularly well while trying to do them all at once, however, don't get excited. Does me being a lesbian affect any of this? On the surface, I have to be some version of a Canadian success because I am poor and <laughs> I am in middle age and still working. There is a possibility that I could have been more of a mainstream success, certainly as an actor, if I had been straight. We all know that women in, on TV and film have to be, I don't know, I don't want to say this without using the F, I'll say effable, right? We, we're watching The Breaking Bad, yes? I'm not giving spoilers. Hank and Walt, versus Marie and Skyler? <laughs> but even if coming out did affect my career, the greater truth is that once I came out, and please don't think that I came out in a blaze of glory or that I was particularly brave. It took me a while, it was torturous. My friend Bruce McCullough says that even my headshot knew I was a lesbian before me. But once I came out, I had access to much more of the creative wellspring in my work. It felt like I had been writing with one hand tied behind my back, or that I had been acting inside a huge windstorm that would whip me this way and that, and sometimes skyward in fantastic arcs of creativity. But I was never touching the ground. And you need to go to ground after about 30 as an actor, or you will get lost. Once I came out, I could write and talk honestly about human relationships. And I could use pronouns when talking about my partner. <laughs> As if when someone says partner, they kind of don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm a pretty good liar. I say acting is lying and writing is stealing. But I couldn't keep up the lie about myself. It was draining, and the web was impossible to follow. The spider in the center of my web of lies was my own furious, judgmental self, exasperated by my own cowardice in the face of shame. I want everyone to come out. Every time someone does, it helps. It, it does help teens to see not so much that it gets better, but that RCMP officers, lowly scubbing actors, doctors, politicians, teachers, live to adulthood and have families and have the personal power to look into a lens and say that it gets better, even if it doesn't. It Gets Better is a Star Trek of gay propaganda. The optimistic view of the future, of the best part of our humanity, and the hope and assurance that it will win out. I do believe in that, I've seen it, I'm old enough to have witnessed great change. I've lived it, and I hope that in so living it, I'm helping to push it along. So let me focus on where I started. When surrounded by people who are more informed, more intelligent than me, like yourselves, I tend to lowball and go for the gut, so that's where I would ask you to join me right now. For those of you who are not gay or who were born after Ellen and after Gay Straight Alliances and Modern Family and the word metrosexual, Please imagine little me growing up in the 70s at a time when the word homosexual was like cancer or affair or menstruation, something we whispered about but we didn't discuss in polite company. And when we did, it was just a tiny bit of a time bomb. I remember my mother sitting at the kitchen table bemoaning something Trudeau had done 
and saying, well, he's a homosexual, otherwise why would he say that thing about the government having no place in the bedrooms of the nation? Whatever homosexual was, I did not want to be that. My mother has come a long way, let me say. You couldn't have a more loving uh, mother and supportive mother and a wonderful sufter to my children. I am grateful to my mother for being a fiery feminist, for constantly pointing out the injustices of her doctor, referring to his nurses as my girls, to the lack of power for women in general, and a portrayal of objects of beauty and stupidity in the media. But my parents did not have gay rights on the radar. They could not have seen it, as my children do now, as a civil and human right. In school, my Hebrew parochial school, it wasn't so much that the word gay or fag or dyke was used as an expletive any more than it is now, but gay was invisible. Gay people were unicorns. They were like fairies or god, kind of a silly, mystical notion. They were just impossible. I uh, started school when I was young. I was a November baby. I, was, uh, I shortly developed those awesome childhood popularity pluses, glasses, and chubbiness, and a love of Star Trek. So already not on the inside of the Hebrew baby school, which my friends is a low bar. <laughs> and then, by the time I was in grade five, I started falling in love with my friends. That's Right? Sounds sweet, right? But not, not, not. It sounds kind of M-O-W-ish, but imagine the effect that that has on your ability to make real friendships. We often see the point of view of the sad, pathetic lesbian in film with feeling unrequited alone in her longing, or, or in other types of films, it's hot. You know, there are, there are maybe a dalliance, there's a girl on a horse or on the swim team or at summer camp. But in real life, there is another dirty secret here. Not only is it lonely and frustrating to be the young lesbian, but she is lying to her friend. She is not being honest about why she loves them. She excuses their warts and the red flags because of their beautiful hair and cute laugh. She will move all their furniture for them and stay up late listening to them cry about their boyfriends and give them back rubs and make them breakfast and muffins and do their homework for them and ask nothing in return but the chance to hold their hair while they vomit. This is not true friendship. Friendship is about give and take, about talking and listening, about each other's needs. I was very happy sublimating my shameful geysers of need in order to just be close and not be found out. I'm sure we've all felt a bit of this in our lives, yes? But the stakes are so much higher when you are gay. If your secrets are spilled, your life can be destroyed. My friendships were all fraught. I assume that many of the people who were drawn to me enjoyed a lesbian lackey, or were wounded and needed a willing gay healer who just loved them. I couldn't be myself at a young, informative age. And as a result, I didn't know who I was. This served me as an actor, because then I loved to disappear into other characters, anyone but myself. And actually, acting helped me come out. Uh, not because there were a lot of gay people in theater school. This was still Canada in the 80s. The smart lesbians were congregating in phys ed and veterinary sciences. But, <laughs> no, I can say it. But, uh, acting helped me come out because uh, in the theater department, uh, there were hers. So, I got cast in a play as a lonely, self-destructive, unrequited lesbian who goes psycho and kills herself. Remember the Bruce McCullough uh, headshot? Obviously, they knew before me. Uh, regardless of how or why I was cast, I was still, I was not out. But I got to kiss a girl, and I liked it. <laughs> and the director, the big perv, had us rehearse the kiss over and over again. I think we need to focus on the kiss moment. <laughs> now I see what that was. Then, I was secretly thinking that I had put one over on everyone. I fell in love with my castmate, who was straight and interested in experiments, so that, that ended well. <laughs> <laughs> and soon, I did fall in love with another lesbian, but she was closeted, and insisted it, uh, that I stay closeted, too. You see, uh, she was a, a born-again Christian, uh, German, with relatives from Germany. Oy vey. Yeah. Also went over well. So every time, I'm just a little detail, every time we did it, she prayed on her knees for forgiveness. We were 19, there was a lot of praying. Um, but it did not help me come out. Finally, by 27, I had had enough. I came out and immediately into one out relationship, then another, the 
person that I am still with 18 years later. I was out in print, in pictures, I was an activist, I was sneaky, I was confrontational about anyone who would treat me differently because of my sexuality. Um, I was out not only in the, uh, my alternative theater work, where really people just, they, don't, they didn't give a crap, um, but also uh, I achieved notoriety as an actor and a writer in the mainstream world of TV and film. I was out in my job as columnist for the Globe and Mail, for the Toronto Star, as an author of a book published by McClellan and Stewart. Bear with me, you can see in my bio, and please buy it. Um, professionally, I wanted to feature uh, article interview with the Globe and Mail about a new TV show I was uh, starring in and had co-written. I referred to myself as Kaiki Dagi Spice. So, also maybe my mom told you about that one. Um, but as I said, my most subversive act as a lesbian was having a child. Now, I used to look at gay people who wanted to get married or who had kids as boring, right? Losing their edge, sellouts, all true. But getting married and having kids and bringing it into the gays, the mainstream, was in a way a continuation of what I was already doing as an artist. Saying, here before you is a woman, please question your assumptions and just view me as a person. I am a lesbian mother of a committed couple. We are all the same. I am a mom. I deal with poop and petulance and pimples just like you. You cannot hate me or you hate yourself. You must not tolerate me. You must accept me. Simply being out and a mother is revolutionary, and it ain't easy. Now, having a baby was not my idea. My partner wanted it, and I wanted her. I had started to heal my overly giving, overly needy, lying, shamed self, and got me a real good one, and I didn't want to share her. I was worried that having a child would change, not just us, but me. And it did. Um, are there any parents in the audience? Oh, don't feel you have to raise your hands. I know how tired you are. <laughs> now, before, <clears throat> before I became a parent, when people used to say to me how having a child changes your life and becomes your focus, I used to think, wow, you must not have much of a career. <laughs> but 11 years later, as a mother of two boys, one 11, one 6, I am besotted, consumed, and obsessed. In short, I, like the rest of you parents, am insufferable. Except in my case, my kids are you know, better than yours. Not, not, no, but it's not a competition. <laughs> um, I have absorbed in the last few years some ancient parenting knowledge, some truth of parenthood that has nothing to do with gender or sexuality. And I can't help sharing some of it with you now. Uh, as you listen, think, does my being a lesbian have anything to do with these universalities? Number one, trying to get diarrhea off of a baby boy's scrotum <laughs> is like trying to get butter off of an English muffin. <laughs> right? We just, right? Sometimes we just leave it, right? We just wait till that time. <laughs> you and me, we do that. If you love something, they will break it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And the line between joy and fear is about four millimeters thick, as thin as a piece of paper, as Julie Bowen's ribcage, as a breath, a wish, a thought. In fact, joy and fear, like homophobia and sex scandals, are in inextricably linked. We may not have wanted to know that, but as parents, we do. And this awareness will permeate every fiber of our beings until the day we die muzzled off. <laughs> Don't think that refers to you? Are you in denial to find out? I will just give you, offer you a simple quiz. Number one, your child gets their first cold. Does this thought flash through your mind? How quickly could this virus cross into his bloodstream, permeate his brain, and become meningitis? <laughs> Number two, they have a rash. Do you somehow feel this is your fault? Do you, some, number three, do you sometimes wonder, is she being bullied because of her pants? <laughs> and four, is it possible to hear any story of any child's tragedy anywhere without a sickening frisson traveling through your gut? If you answered kind of to any of the above, you can count yourself among the, mind, the majority of parents, gay or straight, Trans or cis-typical, we are the ones who say bless you when our child sneezes, even if we're atheists, who knock on wood, cross our fingers, and count our baby's breaths while they sleep. 
In the interest of universality, I can acknowledge that some people do not feel even a mild heart palpitation when their child gets near a squirrel that is undoubtedly rabbit. <laughs> we do not talk to those people anymore. <laughs> they fall into three groups. Highly relaxed and evolved karmic nodals. Those who are too effing busy to indulge in future anxiety. Or amazingly compartmentalized and emotionally detached super achievers who can successfully carry on secret affairs and run major corporations. <laughs> this universal fear unites all parents. I immediately felt kinship with all mothers, including my own. And being a lesbian seemed like a minor difference to me. Admittedly, before becoming a parent, I was already subconsciously in tune with the symbiotic relationship of love and fear. I did mention that I was Jewish and deeply connected to the notion of, God forbid, you should celebrate something good before it actually happens, and then you just wish something bad would happen instead. Why don't you go bang yourself in the head or something? <laughs> Even if you aren't ancestry, ancestrally predisposed to worry, when your heart first opened itself out to love, didn't you also fall in fear? When I first fell in love suddenly from a live and let live party gal, I evolved into an overprotective yenta, if only in my thoughts. I remember one afternoon in those early heady days, I was biking behind my gal, whipping through downtown Toronto traffic and thinking, what a cool urban same-sex couple we were. I was also staring at her butt. In a flash, I imagined myself being hit by a car, snuffed out. Imagine her life in front of me. She was she imagining her getting hit by a car, and what if she was taken from me? And just like that, I could see us both clear as day on the side of the road, me with my hair perfectly airbrushed across, across my remarkably unwrinkled brow. In a gratuitously, a gratuitously expensive crane shot, I saw myself from above, watching my gal's life ebb away as I howled attractively in pain, <laughs> cheating to camera. I snapped to attention just in time from this fantasy to avoid a pothole. I flipped over in the middle of the intersection. My bike fell on top of my head. Luckily, I was wearing a helmet. My gal kept biking, unaware that I had fallen. <laughs> Real love is not attractively lit. It is a bit of a hot mess. When you have a baby, it becomes so much more intense. Whatever anxieties you have are magnified and conscious. I became madly in love with my first son and sickeningly aware of life's underlying terrors. With my second son, I lived, actually, in a land of nightmare, but finding moments of joy. My second son spent most of his first year at Sick Kids in critical condition, and he's had five major surgeries to date, including two open heart. Day after day at Sick Kids, we witnessed our son in danger, in pain, and we were powerless to do anything about it. We saw other babies die, and we nearly lost our own. And one of the results of this experience for me personally, besides alopecia, an addiction to sleeping pills, and a startling loss of close vision, was a cure for my parenting anxiety. So much of which was based on the Jewish concept of what if something happens? Well, when something does happen, you realize there is nothing you can do. You just have to put your head down and move forward. And you do. And by the way, there was no homophobia that we experienced uh, as sick kids in the NICU. Sure, there was curiosity. There were sometimes pointed questions like, who's the real mother? Or the receptionist, who although she'd known me for six months, would often buzz into the NIC room, uh, NICU room and ask, is Jonathan's dad there? So I had everyone call me Mr. Flax for a while. Uh, but mostly the staff was just glad that we were there, that we were involved, and maybe we were they're a bit too much and a little too involved. I, I was asked to speak at an ICU 50th anniversary event, and I asked them, what is worse than a mom who doesn't leave her baby's bedside all day? Two moms. <laughs> One of whom is Jewish. <laughs> Getting back to be, uh, being a lesbian mom, I have one word on that, and that word is meh. As I said, it is less different than I thought. Honestly, in Toronto, we're not that much different. My kids have lots of different kinds of families in their schools. Uh, sure, I might be held at a bit more of a polite arm's length in the mom's group, which is not a bad thing. I will define mom's groups. <laughs> a handful 
circle of strangers who are as shut in with their new needy baby as you are and with whom you have nothing else in common, but who will make you feel both superior and inadequate in the same breath. <laughs> but since I am gay and Jewish and a writer, I don't mind being an outsider. I kind of prefer it. One of the criticisms that people level at same-sex parents, um, these criticisms are often leveled by people who I actually don't give a crap what they're thinking and whose life I impact absolutely zero, but the criticism is that you're not modeling the other gender. Uh, as a couple of moms, we don't model gender roles for our kids. Well, I beg to differ because I'm the bug killer in my house. And I'm the one who the things with the millions of legs in the tub, I kill them. And anyway, it is no big deal if we don't model gender stereotypes, because the world does. As soon as my boys were born, gender started rearing its ugly head. In fact, when I was pregnant with our eldest, we made the decision not to find out the gender of our baby. Now, I wish I could say it was a thoughtful feminist pushback to the overly gendered world, but I was actually because I was afraid that deep down I really wanted a girl, so that if it wasn't a girl, I would be disappointed, and then the baby would somehow feel that disappointed by us most of the center, and he or she would develop a deep emotional problem later on, including resenting me and ending up writing a tell-all book about my lousy, sexist parent. I was young. I had time to think complex thoughts. <laughs> I also was unconsciously beginning to formulate what would become a cornerstone of my parenting philosophy. I tried to give my kids space to become who they are, their own unique essence, resisting the urge to imprint myself all over them. The operative word here is trying. I often fail. Like recently, my eldest child said, uh, I'm not Jewish. And I was like, uh, yes, you are. Suck it up. I mean, I wouldn't want to be either, but you know <laughs> Um, so when I was pregnant, I didn't want to predetermine my attitude to my child or create a, you know, an image of who the baby was before he or she arrived, Give them, giving them one of the few ever cosmic benefits of doubt. However, that didn't stop every other human being from giving a crap about the gender of my child and weighing in when I was still pregnant with gems <coughs> like these. You must be having a girl. Well, why do you say that? Because girls steal your looks. <laughs> Or this doozy by a keen-eyed woman in the uh, Greek video store. You're having a bully. Well, how, how do you know, wise older Mediterranean woman? <laughs> because your butt is so fat. <laughs> Thanks, I, I guess I'll pass on the Twizzlers. <laughs> turned out I was not the least bit disappointed when my eldest was born and they said it's a boy. I was already overcome with love and a fierce desire to maim anyone who would even look at him the wrong way. Um, unfortunately, as soon as my sons were born, the world wanted them to put on a pair of camel underpants. <laughs> I thought I would just read to you a column on babies and gender that I wrote for the Globe and Mail and which I am convinced is why I fired as their parenting columnist. <laughs> and, and you can tell me, because I don't think this is such a fireable offense. It's called, Why Do Men Fear Yellow Sleepers? Here's why I'm asking. In the tradition of the great karmic payback of parenting, we passed some of our old baby clothes on to a dear friend. It was actually my sister. She went through them, held up the cutest yellow sleeper you've ever seen in your entire life, and sighed, oh, and then tossed it onto the reject pile. Why, I asked. She shrugged. Tim will never let our baby boy wear a yellow sleeper. Wow, I had no idea yellow was so close to pink. What's the worst I could ha that could happen, I exclaimed judgmentally. He could be gay? My friend tripped over herself to assure me that neither she nor her husband, whom she refers to as her partner, he does carry a man and watch medium, were not, they were not homophobic. They, they didn't care if their son ended up being gay, she explained. They just didn't want him to look girlier than the other three-month-old blobs. <laughs> My poor friend was squirming. I was so enjoying being self-righteous and judgmental that I pointed out that both she and I were girls. Wasn't her partner's fear of the feminine offensive to women? She popped me on the head with a soother. 
and rightly countered that anyway, the yellow sleeper had spit up stains on them, so what kind of a mother was I dressing my kids like street urchins? <laughs> Many men and women who called themselves feminists back in the day become gender role police once the babies arrive. They find themselves subtly diverting their, the boys from butterfly lunch pails or Dora running shoes. Diego's nice too, I heard a dad whispering conspiratorially to his son in the payless. <laughs> it's the 21st century. Why can't we shake our gender panic? I just can't buy that it's for the sake of our itty bitty infant's future self esteem. Will my six month old be shunned at baby and me yoga for his sun hat with the Y. Joan Crawford brim? Oh no, if we don't give him a buzz cut, none of the other drooling, head-flopping relative newborns will sit with him at movies for mommies. <laughs> there is pretty pressure for girls, too. Baby girls are told how beautiful, how precious, how angelic they are, even as they rip out a hunk of your hair while it's still attached to your scalp. One of literally, and this is true, research bears this out, one of the most frequent comments baby girls hear, do you think you know what it is? I like your shoes. They don't even use shoes. <laughs> All they know about their feet is that they taste good. <laughs> Yellow sleeper fear, or YSF, which is the clinical term you guys probably have in your package, is so visceral that I am sure there are those who claim our gender hangouts are actually hangovers from the caveman days. I'm sorry, but it's time to move on. <clears throat> When's the last time you hunted for food? Do I wander around gathering anything other than dust? How many of us still use our protruding foreheads to crack nuts? <laughs> it is hard to believe that a newborn boy in pink pajamas so threatens the patriarchy, but that just shows on what shaky ground it is founded. There are a few mavericks that actively fight YSF. We have some friends who refuse to use pronouns for their first baby. They gave the baby a page boy and dressed for him in gender neutral color so no one either consciously or unconsciously could predetermine little Dylan's personality by responding to him or her either as a tough little bruiser or a pretty little flower. I admire their tenacity, but I could never have taken the heat that Dylan's parents got. Even when explained politely, people got irritated and outraged by Dylan's parents' refusals to answer, is it a boy or a girl, with anything other than, it's Dylan. The whole thing was fascinating. But it did get a little untenable, you know, for them even after a while, when you get into statements like Dylan has a little rash around his her penis, it's a little time, maybe it's time to move on to fighting something easier than gender, like an active volcano or the tobacco companies. <laughs> Still, there is such a short time, a period of time when we as parents can get away without gender typing our children with what they wear. We need to grab it. Just last week, that bubble of time burst for us. It started out, out well. My eldest son decided to wear nail polish for the first time. I was totally into it. Why shouldn't he enjoy bright colors at his fingertips? And then he said he wanted to wear it to school. I was immediately tempted to destroy the open-hearted notion that we worked so hard to instill that boys and girls could wear anything that they want. Part of me desperately wanted to take the nail polish remover to him. I was torn. Protect him from potential teasing or let him enjoy what clearly delights him and see if he can save off the censure himself and maybe change some little four-year-old minds. I held back. When he came home, he gave me an education about what aesthetics are appropriate to boys and to girls. Further, he decided he didn't want to wear nail polish ever again. I suggested he could wear it at home and just take it off for school. He looked at me like I was from Mars. Why would he want to do that? Didn't I know the rules? Every day, my children teach me that while they may easily pick up my annoying mannerisms almost by osmosis, like whispering boy when they get out of a chair, just thank you, I am not the only mother out there. The world is a harsh and powerful one. So I went out and bought some kid nail polish that washes off with water. We wear it at bath time. Sometimes we even wear yellow. On the girl side, do not even get me started on the princesses. Recently, for uh, I do a CBC radio column uh, every week on parenting, and I spoke with a woman named Peggy Ornstein who wrote the book, it's an incredible book, Cinderella Ate My Daughter. I don't know if you guys know this book. Fantastic. And she said that she interviewed an executive from Leap, Leapfrog Toys who admitted to what he called the pink factor. Basically, by micro-marketing gender-specific toys, parents will buy a pink toy for the little girl and then the exact same toy 
in blue for their boy, double the sales. We know, girl Lego, could I throw something about girl Lego? Ugh. Lego characters in cute little relationships and doing chores, I could just. <laughs> but how can we allow our girls to enjoy the world of dolls and still protect their, our wallets and their self-esteem? So Ornstein advises it's, it's a mistake when parents say no to all the dolls that they dislike and simply offer gender neutral choice to their girls when they ask for the pink. She explains that girls at that age do need developmentally to explore their what they might consider to be a girl identity. And this is the itch that Disney and Mattel are scratching. So she suggests that parents provide other fun images that celebrate girlhood without persistently linking it to appearance or to sexiness, which is just the worst. As an example, she told me that her daughter dressed as Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom and strategy for Halloween. She offered her those images of girlhood. Now, when I had my second son, I was challenged a bit more head on to address my own gender panic, which despite being able to pontificate, I also have. When he was four or five, he loved princesses. And one day he turned to me and said, Mama, do you know why I love princesses? And he said, because I'm beautiful. And then he nailed me with a nerf sword in the face. <laughs> you know, I was in awe with my son's determination to play with princesses, considering what he's up against, starting with the 10 megaton dragon with claws in it that is the marketing industry. Our social structures place such a tremendous value on masculinity, as we know, and, and devalue femininity. So for little boys to feel at such a young age, they have to make sure they fit in. Now, I didn't want to send Johnny the message that there was anything wrong with girl things, but the truth is I was worried how the kids would react based on my son's, my eldest son's experience, that they would tease him. So my gut said, protect him. My heart said, let him do what he loves. And my head did not have enough information to make a decision. So I started to speak to people. I spoke to a woman named Krinzuk, who's a coordinator of the Out and Proud program for the Children's Aid Society. You may know her. She's a former coordinator. She cautioned against looking at this play out of context. She said, it's a normal part of gender development that kids will play and want to experiment and see who they are, that kids should engage in it. It's like when they say, I want to grow up to be a cheetah. I want to grow up to be a girl or a daddy or popcorn. Friend explained that kids under five are not clear about what makes someone a boy or a girl or even about their own gender or that it stays the same. This is not the time to crush them. And the ones that do become what Stephen Solomon from the TPSB calls gender independent kids, imagine how brave and certain they are to hold fast to a different gender identity in a world where gender is one of the last bastions of true permissible stereotype. Crossing its lines brings rage and hatred in a storm. Now, I do want to just close with a little bit of Star Trekian hope. The world is changing, and no staid, Rob Fordish, hateful forces can stop it. My eldest son, Eli, had three other kids in his senior kindergarten class with lesbian moms. And now his teacher is a gay dad who recognized me at the school orientation as having hosted a panel with Dan Savage and Anne Marie McDonald on gay parenting. Talk about an inside track as other teacher is Jewish, so I'm like, whoa, it's great. Uh, I will use anything. Uh, my partner and I have never had a problem in their schools. And if we did, we'd feel empowered to attack. And since you know what kind of mom I am, you know that I mean it. My youngest may still struggle with and against the tsunami of gender norms, but my eldest, who actually didn't know how to tell men and women apart besides their hair, actually saw a, a, a man with long hair and a beard when he was like three and wouldn't believe me that it's possible that a man could have long hair. It's hilarious. Um, the, he said, he now said uh, some very interesting things about gender. This was the boy who decided not to wear nail polish. The other day we were in the car and he asked his little brother if he was excited for grade one. Uh, no, said Johnny, but said it now, obviously. Um, Eli said that he was excited for school because he wanted a fresh start. So I asked, what does that mean? He said, well, he had a plan this year, which was to be friends with the boys and the girls. So the girls don't think he's a dumb lummox, and the boys think he's cool. Now, driving kids everywhere, like a Sherpa on wheels, can be a drag. 
but it's also where you get the most telling conversations. The ones that occur in that protective, sacred cone of sharing that can only happen when there's no eye contact. So I'll just share a few of the doozies that we had recently, like this one. Uh, this was about sex. Uh, when my eldest was in grade four, I'm driving, and he says, Mama, I know something that you didn't know until you were like 20. I said, uh, oh, what, what's that, honey? I can't tell you. I, I don't want to tell you. No, just, it's okay. You can tell me. 69. <laughs> uh, I could never have asked him, what do you think that is, me? Had me not been in the car, right? Luckily, he said he wasn't going to tell me anyway, and it was disgusting. And I was like, yeah, sex is disgusting. <laughs> I'm not I'm trying to be an open, honest guy. Um, there were also milestones of self-awareness that uh, we had in the car, like my, when my youngest was in nursery, and he said that that day in the gym, a mean kid had hit his best friend. And he said, I wanted to push him down like a bully, but I am not a hurt, hurting person. I am a listening boy. I know. Sorry, I can't, I just, just the last story about my kids. Then there was the conversation that they had with each other that I got to overhear. Like, when the little one whispered that he missed his brother so much when he went away on a trip this summer. And the youngest one said, I knew I would miss you, but I didn't know my life would be so hard. <laughs> and then recently, and this is just to, to wrap up, we all had a moment in the car. We were listening to the radio, and you know, some of it's so horrible, but there in the song came on by Macklemore and Ryan Lewis called Saying Love. Do you guys know the song? Right. So some of the lyrics are, uh, if I was gay, I would, I would think, think hip hop, hip -hop hates, me. hates me. Have you read the YouTube comments lately? Man, that's gay, gets dropped on the daily. We become so numb to what we're saying. A culture founded from oppression Yeah, we don't have acceptance for them Call each other faggots behind the keys of a message board A word rooted in hate, yet our genre still ignores it Gay is synonymous with the lesser It's the same hate that's caused wars from religion Gender to skin color, the complexion of your pigment The same fight that led people to walkouts and sit-ins It's human rights for everybody, there is no difference Live on and be yourself So, this song comes on the radio and it's a beautiful song I am crying, and my kids are in the back, and I'm not a big show, show them that I'm crying person, but I wasn't ashamed of it. And my son says, Mama, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Well, why are you crying? And uh, I said, why do you think I'm crying? And he said, because the song. I said, and I said, yeah. In my childhood, I could never have imagined a song like this on the radio. And now it's the backdrop to our driving in their lives. Gender and sexuality are separate. We all know that. But when your sexuality is free from the norm, you can also mess around with gender. You are freer from society's gender norms and gender roles and expectations. In my case, I feel freer in my relationship roles and expectations and in my parenting. I can get down on the floor with my kids, I make train tracks, I toss them in the air as far as I can, and I also bring home the turkey bacon and fry it in a non-teflon coated pan in an era of the house. <laughs> I hope that my sons are learning that women can be everything, that gender should never be limiting. And if women, the least likely to on our gender spectrum, can do anything, so can men. Because this will really be the place of revolution. When men can express all nuance of gender, then we will change the world. Thank you very much.